Hello everyone, welcome back to 3 News Now. I'm Stephanie Haney. Today is Tuesday, September 21st. We start today with sad news for the Catholic community here in Cleveland. The Catholic Diocese of Cleveland has confirmed today that former Cleveland Bishop Anthony Pilla passed away this morning at the age of 88. He has been Cleveland's Bishop Emeritus since retiring in 2006. The current Bishop, Edward Molesic, released the following statement after his passing. It's with deep sadness that I share with the Catholic community of the Diocese of Cleveland the news of the passing this morning of Bishop Anthony M. Pilla. Bishop Pilla died peacefully at his personal residence. In my short time as the Bishop of Cleveland, I came to know Bishop Pilla as a very warm, kind-hearted, and deeply faithful shepherd, always dedicated to the people of the diocese. He was generous with his time and sharing with his knowledge and concern for the diocese with me. As a leader in the National Church, Bishop Pilla was an inspiration and example to me throughout my priesthood and in my years as a bishop. I felt so welcomed by him when I came to the Diocese of Cleveland, a church that he loved so much. As a leader in the community and a friend to so many, he will be greatly missed. He went on to say, please join me in offering prayers for Bishop Pilla and his family. May Bishop Pilla rest in the peace of Christ. The diocese says funeral arrangements will be forthcoming. And with that, we move on to the rest of the top stories from WKYC.com and our WKYC app. Jury deliberations have begun in the trial of Stanley Ford. He is an Akron man accused of killing nine in two separate house fires. Closing statements were delivered on Monday in Summit County Common, Common Pleas Judge Christine Cross's courtroom. The jury went into chambers shortly thereafter. Now he's accused of setting two fires on Fultz Street in Akron, the first of which killed a family of seven in 2017, May 2017. Dennis Huggins, Angela Boggs, and their five children, Cameron, Olivia, Kylie, Deja, and Jared. A sixth child who was 18 was not home at the time of that fire. About a year earlier in 2016, a previous fire claimed the lives of Lindell Lewis and Gloria Jean Hart. Ford was not arrested until about a week after the second fire. He's been in police custody ever since right around May of 2017. Now we're learning more about the last messages sent by Gabby Petito, which were described as odd by her mom, according to a search warrant that has been unsealed. The warrant was issued by Northport Police in Florida to search the hard drive that was found in Gabby Petito's van. It's the van that she was using with her fiance, Brian Laundrie, who was 23, on a cross-country road trip. The text message she sent to her mother, Nicole Schmidt, was on August 27th. Here's what that text said. Can you help Stan? I just keep getting his voicemails and issued calls. That's according to the warrant. It states that Stan referred to her grandfather, but according to the mother, she never called him Stan, and so she was concerned that something was wrong with her daughter, and that's the last communication that anyone had with Gabby Petito. According to the warrant, her cell phone was not operating. She stopped posting anything on social media about their trip, and according to her family, this was not normal behavior for her, and they got worried about her. The warrant also states that conversations between her and her mom before she disappeared showed more and more tension between her and laundry. She was reported missing by her family on September 11th in New York. The authorities believed that she was near Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming, and that's where a body was found that matched the description. However, a full identification is forthcoming on the identity of that body found in Wyoming. Back on August 12th, a 911 call reveals that a witness allegedly saw Brian Laundrie slap Gabby Petito in Utah. They were pulled over for speeding, and at the time of being pulled over, police described the incident as a mental health crisis. But that 911 call is the information that shows that there was a possible physical altercation between the two. The caller said that he saw, witnessed, laundry slapping Petito inside the van, and that they got out of the car and ran up and down the sidewalk before laundry struck Petito. Here in Ohio, there's a proposed Ohio abortion bill. There's two of them that would impose new mandates and also spread misinformation. Now, the Ohio legislature is back from summer break, so they could be reviewing these two Republican-led pieces of legislation. One of the bills, recently introduced by State Representative Jenner Gross, would require physicians to dictate the results of a mandated ultrasound and also provide information about a link 
an alleged link between breast cancer that has been disproven by multiple medical organizations. Now, Gross is usually known for being outspoken for her disapproval of health care mandates, but she's the person who introduced the bill this week. Now, here in Ohio, patients already to have to meet with a physician 24 hours before obtaining an abortion. Now, the Gross bill has not been assigned to a committee for consideration, but it does have several sponsors, all of which are Republicans. Now, in a separate bill, this is seeking to notify abortion patients of possible risks. That was introduced during the legislature's summer break. It has been assigned to the House Health Committee. It's House Bill number 378. It was introduced in July by state representatives Kylie Kohler and Sarah Fowler, both Republicans. It targets medication abortion, which is done through a two pill regimen rather than a surgery to terminate the pregnancy. Now, this bill would require medical professionals to explain what is considered a controversial and medically unproven method of so-called reversing the abortion by not taking the second of the two pills and giving additional progesterone to counteract the first pill in that medication abortion. Now, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists said claims about this reversal method are not based in science and don't meet clinical standards. This bill, the second bill, is a reintroduction of a similar one that passed the Senate in 2019 but didn't make it through the House. Here in Ohio, abortion is legal in this state up to 20 weeks of gestation. Now let's take a look at the latest numbers for COVID-19 here in Ohio. In the last 24 hours, Ohio has seen 6,914 new reported cases of COVID-19. The total number of confirmed and probable deaths here in Ohio is now at 21,596. Right now, there are 3,700 people, 3,715 people, excuse me, currently in the hospital being treated for COVID-19. Out of those people, 1,037 of them are being treated in an intensive care unit. Now let's turn the conversation to some controversy surrounding the season opener for the Cleveland Browns. Not this past Sunday, not two days ago, but the Sunday before that when the Browns were in Kansas City, they lost that game to the Kansas City Chiefs. Well, it was during that game that safety Ronnie Harrison Jr. was fined for shoving Kansas City Chiefs running backs coach Greg Lewis during that game. Harrison Jr. was also ejected from the game. Now we are learning now, according to reports, that even though he wasn't ejected for the game, the coach Lewis was ultimately fined for the incident. That's according to Yahoo Sports' Charles Robinson. Now, we don't know exactly how much Lewis was fined. We do know that Browns Center and NFL Players Association President J.C. Treader told Robinson of Yahoo Sports that it had been communicated to the Players Association that Lewis was, in fact, fined. Now, Harrison Jr. was reportedly fined more than $12,000 for his role. Here's what happened in case you need a recap. After bumping into two Chiefs offensive linemen, Harrison appeared to step on running back Clyde Edwards Hilaire. From there, that led to Lewis pushing Harrison. And then from there, Harrison Jr. shoved Lewis in the face with an open palm. That resulted in a personal foul on both teams and Harrison being ejected from the game. And as we are now learning, apparently Lewis also being fined for his role in that. Now, bringing things back to this week, we got a new show that we have going on. It's on YouTube every Monday or every day after a Browns game. Sometimes that'll be on a Friday if it's a Thursday game and so on and so forth. It's called Three Things About the Browns. And this week I have our sports reporter Nick Camino joining me. We are talking about what happened with the defense in that win over the Houston Texans in the home opener, which we love a win. We definitely love a win. We are excited about that. But we want to talk about some things moving forward because, you know, we want to be in the big game, right? So we need to look at these things. So Nick Camino talks with me about what happened with the defense. Also the injuries, Baker Mayfield with that left shoulder, Jarvis Landry with that MCL issue and what we can expect to move forward. What's the big deal and how we can move forward from that. And then also looking ahead to next Sunday against the Chicago Bears, also at home, the possibility that the Browns face former Ohio State quarterback Justin Fields instead of the Bears quarterback Andy Dalton. So we take a look at all of that. It's called Three Things About the Browns. You can find it on the WKYC YouTube page and on WKYC.com. Now, speaking of fights, the fight between uh, Ronnie, Ronnie Harrison Jr. and Coach Lewis, maybe you could call that a fight. There was definitely some shoving going on, but it didn't, it didn't have anything on the fight that happened in the Muni lot on Sunday for the Browns home opener. It started with two people just squaring off against each other, and then from there, it's basically a brawl because two more people get in on it. They're trying to separate the people, and then that turns into a bigger fight. Other people jump in. It shows multiple people throwing punches at one another, crashing into tables. 
This was all at the first time people were allowed back in the Muni lot since 2019, by the way, because there was no tailgating during the 2020 season because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, emotions were definitely high, to say the least. Lots of energy in the Muni lot on Sunday. And if you missed it, if you weren't down there, you had plenty of opportunities to see it because it was all over the Internet. It got picked up by TMZ, the New York Post, Bleacher Report. We have it on WKYC.com. So if you want to see the antics from the Muni lot, you can check that out. That's it for your three news now update today for Tuesday, September 21st. I'll see you back here tomorrow with more three news now.